Yay. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. Hello. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Can can you hear us in the audience? Um, welcome so much to the very first Analog Astronaut Conference. And we're so happy to have you here this morning. We've got a wonderful and distinguished panel of researchers and scientists and doctors um, here to discuss their work, discuss their analog adventures and their other expeditions, and um, just here to give us all the information we need to know. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce myself uh, first. I'm Dr. Brandi Nunez. I am a veterinarian, a microbiologist, I'm a modular synth musician and composer, um, and uh, some of you may know me under my stage name, Space Racer, um, but uh, I've just come back from another analog at high seas where uh, my commander, Dr. Musilova, is doing some amazing research, and um, we just did so many amazing things up there, and I, I can't wait to share my adventures with everyone, um, but for now, we'll um, turn it over to our panelists. Let me just do a very quick uh, introduction. Um, we've got Dr. Ryan Kobrick, uh, or Ryan Space, as people know him as. Um, he's a space advocate, a former professor, an explorer, and now with Paragon Space Development Corporation. Um, I'll just introduce you all very quickly, and then we'll turn it over to you. Um, we've got Karen Bruneman. Um, she has um, got advanced degrees in psychology, business information systems, and uh, doing a PhD currently, unless you're already done, I'm not sure. That might've been old information, but um, an international trainer, um, a flight planner, um, and um, just doing all kinds of amazing things, wearing many, many hats. Um, we've got with us amazing Dr. Shauna Pandya, esteemed physician, a possum program, um, astronaut candidate, um, Explorers Club Fellow, uh, Assembly or Orbital Assembly Corporation Medical Director, and um, just doing so many things here from Canada, Dr. Pandia. And then um, looks like uh, we're missing Elliot, and hopefully he'll he's on the East Coast with us, so hopefully he'll come in soon, or that might be him joining us. Um, and there he is, the man of the <laughs> Elliot. Um, Elliot Roth, everyone, CEO of Spira Inc. Um, he's a synthetic biologist, an adventurer based out of SoCal where I am, and an algae farmer, Elliot Roth. And last but not least, um, Dr. Miroslav Rozlojnik from Bratislava. <laughs> I got some help with that from Dr. Musilova. <laughs> Um, we've got, a, he's a researcher, a lecturer, an expert in hyperbaric medicine and microbiology and diving physiology. We're so pleased to welcome you all to this panel and happy to hear you talk about your research. So uh, let me just turn it over um, to you guys. I'll have you talk for a few moments about your work, about your um, research and a quick bra a background, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, let's start with Karen. Yes, thank you very much. Um, further to what was already said, um, yeah, I, um, I'm from Slovakia as well as uh, Dr. Musilova, so uh, we have some connections there. Um, I manage my own company here, um, more than 25 years in international uh, working and training experience um, in the areas of... Uh, of um, um, intercultural competence, project management, leadership skills. I have developed some special trainings for the space industry. And I'm also a lecturer and author for uh, psychology at International University in Germany. Um, relating to my affiliation to the analog um, mission space, um, I'm a flight planner for the Amade 20 uh, mission of the Austrian Space Forum, which will take place in October. Um, in uh, the Negev Desert in Israel, where we have uh, more than 20 technical, psychological, biological, geological, etc., experiments. So that's that's a very big mission for with the duration of an entire month. And I'm also a cooperation partner of the Habitat Marte um, station in uh, in Brazil. And um, I'm 
working with a number of uh, international groups of researchers, and we are looking into psychological and cultural aspects of, uh, of space exploration. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my involvement in the, in the analog mission space. That's wonderful and how exciting. Yes, uh, Habitat Marte, it's a place I, one of the places I'd like to explore and visit. Mm, it's, the only, it's the only analog habitat on, in the Southern Hemisphere. That's right, that's right. So uh, Ryan, can we hear from you next? Yeah, um, so hi, uh, as introduced, I work for Paragon. We focus on life support and extreme environments. So I'm an aerospace engineer, I'm from originally from Toronto. So I'm a Canadian American border walker. Hopefully, you know, won't see those borders from space one day, but uh, I think we all want to make our, our way there one day. Um, I'm on the panel under spacesuit, so I figured I'd kind of offer some thoughts. We have a lot of amazing panelists here and not a lot of time. So I actually wrote down a couple of thoughts last night at midnight, of course. Um, so let me just share with that. That should take just a minute or two. And then uh, I'm looking forward to Q&A with everyone and, and Q&A throughout the day um, through chat. So make sure you guys drop stuff into the community as well. So let's talk about spacesuits, analog spacesuits. Um, all of them that I wore across the six missions I've been involved with, uh, including four months in the Arctic, which started about 14 years ago today. Well, they all sucked. Um, so I'm going to be a little controversial for a few minutes just to get things going. Um, if we have time, we can go into the details of the mobility and the dexterity, but that's not what I want to focus on for this spacesuit rant. Um, not on the literal, you know, I don't want to talk about the trash can and fishbowl that they're actually made of in some cases. Um, so, you know, those, that's just what it is. But I took all my missions extremely seriously with the attitude that we were contributing to figuring out how do we do Mars exploration. But the suit sucked. Uh, it didn't matter. Uh, they provided the basic experience uh, that could allow suspense of disbelief and allow a submerged experience. Um, so my hypothesis is this. Uh, there's a minimal amount of costume, if you will, uh, required in order to pass like a psychological threshold of not hindering the analog experience. Um, maybe it's equivalent to a fictional superhero putting on their spandex and thinking they're suddenly invincible. Um, it's just enough to transform you, uh, your mental load, if you will, into a different reality. So my advice is this uh, on suits. It'd be very easy to continue along the same path and crews would feel the analog experience, or we can increase spacesuit fidelity which would actually help us prepare for the difficulties that are guaranteed to happen with a lack of mobility. Um, sometimes being uncomfortable is the best way to make discoveries. Uh, it may mean that you only get to go a few feet into a lava tube, um, but this might be the reality of an ex exploration expedition. Uh, so I think the next time I'm in an analog, I might have to like bring my hockey gear and equipment instead, instead of just a plain jumper, you know, painter suit, uh, who knows. Um, so I just want to acknowledge also, you know, there's people that are working on different suits around the world, and I want to acknowledge the Austrian Space Forum. Um, their spacesuit design actually uses an exoskeleton that works against you to make it feel like you're fighting the pressures of something like the EMU. Uh, that's how they mapped it, that the load to it. So it's pretty cool. Um, so to wrap this all up uh, with one sentence, I guess you can say, um, I think it's time to increase spacesuit fidelity um, above the psychological acceptable threshold and all learn how to moonwalk and Mars walk. So that, that's my few minutes, thanks. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, we, we just had a conversation at high seas. Um, you know, I think those, those suits are probably better than some that I've seen uh, at other analogs, but um, still not the best and have their issues. And it's just so difficult to get any research done in those caves. I mean, I yeah. look like an idiot, you know, getting my bag and just <laughs> the simplest things become just the hardest tasks to do, you know, <laughs> require advanced degrees just to open your <laughs> bag. So, um, I hear you. And I, I look forward to the day that we have um, just all of the new technology coming together um, you know, the, the suits that the Dragon crew wear are just amazing. And I hope all of um, this new technology will trickle down into um, the analog world as well. And we can do, um, you know, testing and do uh, the research that is required um, as far as the limitations on Earth for these new uh, generation, next generation of spacesuits. Okay. Well, that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So <laughs> next, um, let's take it to... Um, 
Let's take it to Dr. Shauna. Dr. Pandya, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, wonderful to see some, some familiar faces as well as some um, new faces as well. Ron is definitely giving me attitude behind the scenes. So uh, wow. keeping me on my toes. Thanks, Ron. So for those who don't know me, um, Canadian physician, um, I do have some analog experience and always looking to get more. And I'm happy to tell the audience more about it and further some more discussion. So briefly, I've been lucky enough to um, do two Mars Desert Research Station rotations, first as a crew medical officer, and then secondly as a commander, um, right as the pandemic hit, which was very interesting watching um, from Mars as Earth got taken over. Um, and then uh, I was also lucky enough to be the crew medical officer on a five-day underwater aquanaut mission called Neptune. As everyone in the audience knows, we love our acronym in space. Um, and exploration. So Neptune is no different, stands for Nautical Experiments in Physiology, Technology, and Underwater Exploration. So this was at the Jewels Undersea Lodge over five days in 2019. We were lucky enough to, um, uh, you know, work really well as a team. We could, we designed the studies and the science, had the IRB approved, which was really formative in um, bringing our team together. We performed technology demonstrations, um, perform science related to physiology about potential stress levels, psychology batteries. Um, and, you know, it was uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, the rest of my experience extends to um, other manner of analogs. So within the microgravity and altered gravity um, realm, I've been lucky enough to conduct six parabolic flight um, campaigns, mostly with IVA or intravehicular activity suit testing. Um, have worked with Project Possum uh, and IIAS, so both acronyms, Polar Support with Science of the Upper Mesosphere at IIAS is International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. Um, we partnered with Final Frontier Design um, to test their EVA spacesuit, extravehicular activity spacesuit with the Canadian Space Agency. So this is another way in which we um, uh, mimic altered gravity environments. So imagine a harness, you offload your weight and you can replicate microgravity, lunar gravity, uh, Martian gravity, um, other ways in which uh, I, in other environments in which I've been in altered gravity was hypergravity in centrifuge studies. I was a test subject with the University of Texas Medical Branch. I've done some water testing. Um, so I was lucky enough to to visit Aquarius Reef Base where the NASA NEMO missions have been held. I haven't stayed there for extended time, haven't been there in saturation. Um, I've done IVA water uh, suit water testing, and then also um, as a matter of analog testing, run my run the operational space medicine course with Project um, Possum, and so we're essentially teaching our students to be become medical space MacGyvers in a resource limited austere environment. So that's a lot, but that's the overview and introduction to me, and I'm so excited to be part of this panel and be talking more about what I do. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. And I can't wait to hear more about it. Um, let's go to Elliot, uh, my buddy from SoCal and a new research collaborator. Thanks for being here, Elliot. Hey, everybody. Um, so I am a humble algae farmer. Um, I participated in Celine One, which was at high seas back in September. Um, so a little bit less notches in my belt uh, when it comes to different kinds of uh, analog experiences, but I am a synthetic biologist and uh, self-taught synthetic biologist as well as biomedical engineer. I particularly like getting people to try very strange things um, when it comes to eating things. And so I like taking pond scum and making it pond yum, uh, taking all kinds of different algae and then using it to produce uh, the various food ingredients that would go to make life in a habitat uh, worthwhile and uh, livable for extended periods of time during deep, deep duration, long duration space missions. Um, while I was at high seas, I conducted 12 different experiments. Uh, many of them related to uh, psychology. I have a number of collaborators at uh, Army Research Labs, USC, University of Rochester, um, Stanford, uh, and a number of others that are all around uh, the efficacy of teams in habitats and kind of self-efficacy and different kind of soft skills, social training. Um, then I'm really interested in the use of synthetic biology in a space-based environment. Um, 
namely collaborating with a number of folks on using mycelium to create building materials. Um, we also conducted some slime mold testing to enable ha habitat mapping or, or uh, lava tube mapping, which is kind of intriguing. Um, and then a couple of sponsored experiments uh, from other companies that directly relate to how do you actually produce the basic necessities of people in a space-based environment. And so constantly on the lookout for other collaborators to bring uh, different kind of test cases in, solve the basic physiological needs of food, water, and shelter in C2. Um, my primary work though centers around how do you produce the base level ingredients using photosynthetic organisms. And so um, for, if you've uh, been at high seas anytime after September, you may have tried some of my company's ingredients, um, Spira's ingredients. We produce a colorant from algae. Uh, we also produce proteins from algae and really nutritionally dense food products. Um, so yeah, be on the lookout for some of new upcoming experiments. I may make you taste and try and eat something a little bit strange, but don't worry, completely safe and definitely nutritious. Thank you. Yes, we did make our fair share of blue pancakes and popcorn and blue lemonade at high seas um, with your delicious blue powder. <laughs> it's fun. It's an adventure. Um, all right. Well, thank you for that. And we look forward to hearing more about it. And uh, last but not least, let's hear from Dr. Rose Lojnik um, about your research. And I am so interested in hyperbaric medicine and diet physiology. So I, I can't wait to hear more about it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, hi everyone, and thank you for having me here. Uh, for more than twenty, for more than twenty years, uh, I'm involved in the research of hyperbaric medicine and uh, diving physiology. Uh, currently, I'm teaching at uh, medical faculty in Australian Czech Republic uh, hyperbaric medicine uh, to medical students, and also I'm involved in research and, uh, and safety activities of Dan Europe organization. As you can imagine. Uh, doing research on divers uh, really brought me to to different places worldwide. Uh, just to may maybe to mention the most signif significant for me uh, was uh, expedition in Greenland uh, above the polar circle uh, during under the polar expedition, where I was responsible for all underwater research and activities uh, where we studied effect of uh, of uh, deep cold water diving on, on divers. Uh, uh, this all I mean. Uh, brought me uh i mean being in in all to all of these places and uh, really uh, seeing diving from different perspectives uh brought me to an idea that uh, diving can definitely offer more than uh, let's say um, a tool to mimic microgravity what is currently the major use of, of diving for for astronauts and uh, therefore a few years ago i started to work on the on idea, I call it from from depth to Mars, and uh, I also started to be more involved in analog mission activities. And uh, currently, I am collaborating with Echo Encounter Institute in Israel uh, on uh, on some research for Amade 20 mission, and I'm also go, uh, undergoing the training uh, to become a flight planner for Amade 20 mission. And uh, really, the most exciting, uh, what is uh, just uh, I would say, in front of the door. Uh, is uh, my participation as an analog astronaut in uh, underwater uh, analog mission, which uh, should occur occur in uh, in approximately five weeks in Czech Republic, and it will be carried out in a uh, hydronaut uh, underwater habitat. So that's all from my end. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I've always wanted to you know do something like a Nemo. Um, in an analog or another underwater, um, fully immersed analog. So um, I look forward to the day that more of that will be available. Uh, yeah, an amazing work. Thank you so much. So now that we've introduced everyone, I guess I'd like to um, just talk about a few questions that we, uh, you know, the general questions, um, and then at the end we'll open it up to some audience questions and some pre-submitted questions, but. Um, let's just talk about um, a, a basic a, a basic question. Um, in your opinion, what are the, some of the most pressing or compelling areas um, that we need to research in these analogs or on Earth um, in order to make our time and our plans and space um, doable and accessible and safe? 
So it, to anyone who wants to jump in. I think, um, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, um, of course, the rocket science as such, launching Starship, launching whatever, um, it's very exciting. Yeah, it throws a lot of flames and things explode. So that's something that is cool to watch on, on video. Um, what we must not forget about all these, uh, these uh, technological aspects is the focus on the human factors. Um, I think we're more ready with, uh, with a rocket that can fly us to Mars then we are actually ready to fly people to Mars. Um, and I'm talking in terms of psychological training, psychosocial models, intercultural competence for astronauts, as, uh, as Dr. Scott just mentioned in his talk. So um, we haven't talked about a Mars culture. You know, we know that we have, for example, a min about 20 minutes communication delay between Earth and Mars. So what does that mean for our culture? What does this mean for, for a culture that communicates indirectly? We can't do that anymore. We don't know what kind of culture is the best to have on Mars, and there is far too little talk about, about that. So uh, we need to do a lot more research into these areas, into psychological factors, cultural factors, etc. That's so true. Uh, the psychology, even on short missions, but on these long durations and month or year long missions, um, we're really going to see people's personalities and quirks and issues develop. And so to have a good protocol and to have um, good plans in place to help people, you know, after all, we're only human, right? So um, we're susceptible to the stressors and the pressures, um, especially in these unknown and scary environments. So. Who else would like to offer yeah. some insight into that question? I can jump in. And so um, I think the most important question when we talk about what are we trying to achieve with analogs is looking at the why. And so, um, you know, the first principle is we're trying to be analogous to the space flight environment, uh, most cases. And so what are we trying to achieve then? Well, it helps to know the big five factors of, um, you know, how space is trying to kill us, right? And that's radiation, isolation, confinement, partial and altered gravity environments, distance from Earth, um, and then everything else which falls under hostile environments. And so there's so many ways um, in which we can, um, uh, you know, employ an analog, whether it's uh, uh, technology demonstration, because at the end of the day, space is hard, space is expensive, space is trying to kill us. We want to mitigate, we want to identify, mitigate risk. We want to iterate upon any designs for technologies we're using. Um, we can certainly, um, uh, as the last panelist was saying, we can certainly make use of the isolation confinement to conduct social set, psychosocial studies. Um, we can replicate the altered day night cycles. At MDRS, there have been crews who have moved to Mars time. Um, we can um, look at, we can replicate the, the issue, known issues with lunar regolith um, to the best of our abilities. And so the question at the end of the day is, you know, what are the risks of space flight and what opportunities do we have to mitigate them? And I would say that, you know, as long as we're remembering the dangers of space, um, as well as the challenges of packing for space, um, those are the best ways in which we can answer particular questions. And EVA, technology demonstration, psychosocial, I would say are the top three. Yeah, that's that's so true and such a good point. Um, Anyone I'm else? Of, yeah, Elliot. Yeah, yeah, I would say um, that all of those points are are definitely correct. The the psychosocial aspect and the interaction of the crew dynamics that's that's predominantly what I think these analog missions end up testing. I think that it also tests failure modes um, in a very safe way, and so you can tell whenever a team is kind of uh, in conflict or fighting or anything like that. And I don't think that's a, that's a negative. I think that's actually really a positive. You identify um, what a good crew composition is. Um, you also identify what, a, what it, bad crew compositions or um, where conflict might occur, other things like that, because you're able to get that many like reps or iterations of what a analog mission could be or, um, rather than having the risk of sending people up into a dangerous environment. And the the other things that I think are really intriguing are what actually makes for a good astronaut candidate. You are able to really identify 
uh, the different psychological qualities and the interaction of people and start over successive iterations, start identifying what it means to be in this kind of extreme environment. Uh, the sort of research that I really enjoy doing is that sort of uh, psychosocial uh, long-term analysis. No one really likes taking surveys in these analog spaces, but um, it's one of those things where it's absolutely essential in order to derive any kind of conclusion on how people interact with each other. And I'm really excited about the, the kind of um, overall and literature reviews that we can do as we organize more as an astronaut, analog astronaut community. Uh, the other things that are really intriguing to me are uh, the interface between people and technology. I think that the testing of technology can be done without people oftentimes, and uh, you can get those sort of you can understand how technology would function in an in in-stream environment, but the actual interaction, the user experience and user interface of technology, um, you need to test it in a very low impact way uh, where it's not mission critical uh, piece of technology. And so if you're doing something uh, on the cutting edge, like for example, genetically engineered algae to feed people, uh, that is something that is much more suited to an analog environment prior to going into space. And so those are the kind of things that I take a look at that I think are really, really intriguing that analog environments really test. Yeah, that's fascinating. And of course, that's the point of these analogs really is to, to test these things first before we get up to space and realize, oh, they don't work. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, if I can, if, if I can, if I can add, uh, from my perspective, I would say that uh, we really should focus more on, on the complexity of all the analogs, uh, because I have impression that, uh, uh, I mean, really doing uh, very complex things uh, in, in analogs, uh, including really like uh, whitelessness, using uh, live support units, etc. I think this is the must what uh, needs to be done in order really to, to understand also the mindset of, of people participating in such uh, analog mission and, and of course uh, for, for, for the uh, future uh, flights, uh, because uh, really uh, this is a different mindset. Uh, I see it in divers, I see it also in variety of other people, and uh, we really need to understand what is this driving force uh, for these explorers to be able to maybe to sometimes even to compromise their safety towards achieving the goal and uh, definitely we need to understand uh, also their reaction to such uh, extreme condition and extreme stress. Exactly, and I think um, that leads back to, um, to another question that was posed. Um, because, you know, these are analogs and because we, you know, aren't truly in danger, I guess for most of them we're not. Um, or the danger is um, limited, you know, how, um, how, I guess, um, realistic or how, you know, I mean, I can see that there's always a place for it, but um, in reality, how, how much do we learn from these analogs? How much can we get out of these um, by doing these uh, on earth missions or um, these simulated missions? Um, I'll open it up. Sure. I'll, maybe I'll take a swing. Um, I forgot I was on the panel. I was just so busy watching and listening that it's like, oh, wait, I'm on this. Um, yeah, so there's uh, a lot of different ways of answering that. Um, I think that just giving people the exposure and being able to actually participate in these, uh, give them a taste of what the considerations might be, especially when it comes to like con ops and understanding the flow um of using technology taking samples doing all those things in the field um and it gives them a little bit of hands-on experience that helps them when they go back to their job um as almost like a cross training to an interdisciplinary cross training because they start to see the other side of it as well if they're an engineer they start seeing some of the science that would be involved in the field and vice versa so um that exposure overall just kind of helps move everyone along and trains them and cross trains them as well I think we are actually just in the middle of a, of a very big analog uh, mission, and that is the COVID pandemic. Yeah, we have had many people, and still have many people, who have to isolate, who risk their lives when going shopping. Yeah, so we, we will gather a lot of data that is valuable for future missions. Um, 
And uh, this is a, a real threat. Yeah, this is not a hypothetical threat um, that, that you can catch COVID and you can get seriously ill or, or worse. So um, that can also contribute to, to our research in that area. And then, of course, we have, uh, as, as, as Dr. Scott mentioned in his presentation, uh, being in a really extreme environments, like, uh, like um, in the Himalaya mountains or under the Greenland ice shelf, that is is something where you don't have the safety net. Yeah, in an in an analog mission like uh, the Austrian Space Forum in in uh, Israel, yes, there will be doctors nearby, and you can help get help very soon if you need it. And of course, you have that in the back of your mind. But I think uh, Miroslav can tell a bit about how this is very different um, in the diving uh, analog missions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, with diving, it's uh, it's uh, I mean, it's it's very nice that you can really basically simulate the situation where you have a remote rescue, and uh, basically you can really get a delayed access to any kind of help. So and it can really range from minutes um, uh, up to up to sometimes in even days. So for example, in my uh, uh, during my expedition in Greenland, uh, of course we had the doctors on board. Uh, we were all trained in, uh, in uh, providing first aid, but still uh, getting uh, let's say advanced healthcare uh, assistance from hospital would take us uh, like uh, 24 hours, even I mean in, in, in good flight conditions. So, and this is something what really um, you, you need to keep in mind, uh, especially when you do, for example, diving activities. Yeah, I think the, the health and safety aspect is, is oftentimes really intriguing in these sort of environments. I think that can be um, almost replicated by distance or um, if you are in isolation somewhere. Um, that definitely can be replicated. I think the the key point of analog missions is that you don't want it to get to the point of danger, but you, you do have the potential for danger. Um, you kind of want to make sure that you're not testing, for example, like a zero gravity sucking chest wound uh, experiment if you don't have to. Like that, that would not be a good situation in an analog astronaut mission. But um, the the kind of social interaction, I think, is really intriguing when you put it in the pic in in context of the pandemic. Something that I noticed about our um, analog astronaut crew is that we start developing our own language. You start developing your own jargon and means of communicating. And uh, there's a whole lot of richness when it comes to interpersonal and intersocial communication uh, on a crew itself. And something that I think is not as explored uh, when it comes to the astronaut corps. In addition, I think as an analog community, we have a whole lot more people that are able to be tested. And that, that diversity of participants is really intriguing. Um, when it comes to the astronaut corps, you've really only had about like 550 people go into space at any time. And so it's, it's quite intriguing to uh, see how people from different backgrounds, contexts, cultures um, end up interacting in a space-based environment in this kind of extreme environment. Um, I would I would caution and like urge that safety matters overall, but I do think that um, the the kind of crew dynamics, especially in much longer duration missions, are going to be the most important bit. I we likened it to the the squishy bits of human interaction, um, and so uh, Don Marsden said, "What are the what are some of the most effective site governments models for analog settings?" Not entirely sure where to go with that that sort of question, but I do think that those are kind of the important research questions that should be asked. How do we actually interact? Um, what are, yeah, what are those squishy bits? Yes, so, I love it. Squishy okay. bits. Lots of COVID squishy bits now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when we're talking about the safety, we have to talk about, um, you know, firstly, first principles of, you know, what are the two aspects of safety? First of all, we're trying to replicate the, um, the fidelity of the spaceflight environment, given the context of our analog, whether it's, you know, being remote, whether it's being partial gravity. Um, but then the other thing is, you know, what challenges do that particular analog bring with it? And so, for example, 
the easiest one to look at is something like Nemo and Aquarius Reef Base. Um, where you are about 50 feet underwater um, and you know once you're in there and for a prolonged period of time you're in saturation and so if you have a fire in the have it's not as simple as evacuating and going to the surface you're going to get a dive injury air embolisms are bad um, so if you um, if you're looking at the constraints and challenges of Nemo um, you have to decompress for 15 hours and 47 minutes to be able to say I'm safe to surface now. Um, you know, same thing on our Neptition. Because we were at 20 feet, we didn't have that um, same aspect of um, needing to decompress. Mm -hmm. But there were on our, our EVAs, which were our dives, there were um, local fauna, there were scrapes, there were abrasions. So you kind of have to have these two mindsets of, you know, how am I looking at the, how am I mitigating hazards of the space flight environment? How am I doing good for bioastronautics and human space exploration? but also how am I preparing for this particular environment? And does my medical kit reflect that? And if so, why not? And how do I mitigate this risk? Just to add to the um, the experience side of the things here, um, for FMARS up in the Arctic, so it's 2007, so it's a while, a while way back. Um, the, uh, the emergency procedure there was also pretty intense. Um, the you couldn't just evacuate something someone if something went wrong um at best you know if a plane was available in resolute and you were able to contact them it would take at least an hour for the plane to arrive uh on site and that's that's not necessarily with medical um assistance as well uh the landing conditions kind of vary when we arrived in may we were landing on skis on the twin otter plane uh and by the end of the summer uh, we were just using a dirt runway, essentially, right next to the other camp up there on the Houghton Impact Crater. Um, so the the aspect of safety was always part of our uh, mission profile. We actually had a, a daily or twice a day check-in with the local polar resources there, the polar shelf, um, as part of our protocol. Um, it wasn't really real time because they basically did around the horn of all the different camps that were out in the field and you'd respond, yes, we're still here. And if they didn't hear from you for, I think it was like three in a row or like two days in a row, then they might have to then, you know, take the next step and to visit your campsite. Um, so all these things are really real. Um, and so it helps keep you in the right frame set that, you know, this is actually dangerous. We're in the middle of nowhere. There's no one that's going to help us. And we had a, a few minor injuries, uh, as kind of mentioned for the other analogs, but you, those are the ones you go in prepared for. And obviously if they were, the injuries were worse enough, then we would have to do some sort of evacuation and, and break the simulation. Um, so, yeah, th those are like real aspects of all these things and um, things that need to be considered as part of the profile. So if you've got something that might, an evacuation that might take days um, and you only have a short simulation, then, you know, you've, you've closed the window on any possible actual research that you want to conduct while you're actually there. Yeah, that's such a good point. And the bottom line, I guess, sounds like for most of you guys that these analogs do feel real. And, and you know, when you're in there, as long as you're putting the time and you're putting the effort and um, you're you're in there for the experience and the research, um, it is real. And you do do some serious crew bonding as well. And those uh, even for short missions, you know, I've become very close with my crews that I've been on analog missions with. And um, couldn't be greater. So I think there was a question about um, uh, from Paul back in, seems like a prospective Martian mission crew ought to winter over in Antarctica together first. I think that was mentioned uh, before. Um, I think it's a great idea, you know, send you to a cold, inhospitable place and learn to live together and work together as a crew. <laughs> it sounds like a good idea. I mean, we could also do that in Canada. We're also cold and inhospitable. That's true. It's closer. So maybe Canada is a good spot. <laughs> I just love the iron, or the irony here, where we're all, we've all been in like somewhat isolation for a year, but we're all like thinking about where's the next spot that I'm going to run to to be in isolation again. <laughs> so um, I think we're all chomping at the bit to you know get reengaged and be involved and go to these crazy places, you know. And yeah, I'd love to go back to Canada and visit my family. It's been a year and a half, so there's other yeah. isolations that are happening uh, for a lot of us. With, uh, with borders and different rules and different availability to medicine vaccinations and things like that. So 
Uh, soapbox, if you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated because there's a lot of people out there that can't um, and it'll help. <laughs> so. And with that question, I'm actually curious as to what different analogs are doing in the era of COVID. I've seen successful missions be conducted. Um, I myself have canceled um, analogs, I've canceled any travel um, to be cautious and focused on medicine. Um, but, you know, looking at um, friends and colleagues going on missions, they're doing it successfully. So I'm just wondering of what my fellow panelists, sorry to, to hog the stage, but I'm curious, it's a timely question. Um, how you've been managing your missions in the era of COVID. Yeah, I mean, I can speak for the Ocean Space Forum. The Amadi 20 mission has been postponed for one year. It was called Amadi 20 because it was supposed to take place in 2020. Um, we have just just um, postponed it for a, for a full year. And um, the uh, Habitat Mate uh, took a different approach. They went virtual with their missions as far as possible. And they still got not, of course, you can't do the full scope of research, but you still can get something done. And I think that was quite a good example of, of, of uh, being innovative as well. And I'll just speak to that very quickly. Um, I did just return from a high seas mission and um, they basically they just make you have a ne two negative COVID tests. Um, you know, high seas is in Hawaii, so it's a very controlled uh, island, and they test you the second you arrive and set foot on the island. And once you're negative, um, you just go directly to the habitat, and you don't wear your mask for two weeks, which is really uh, a strange phenomenon in this day and age. But it's amazing. Um, so that's how they're doing it there. They just you know you have to have several negative tests. Um, some of our crewmates were already vaccinated, but I wasn't at the time. Now I've had my first shot. So, and I know they are going to be discussing analogs in a, a upcoming panel. So uh, we can move on. Um, I, there was another question. What are some of the difficulties you've faced and how, uh, you know, during these analogs or preparing or maybe even just getting into them and um, how could those be overcome or improved? Oh, pick me. <laughs> um, I'll start. I'll start with a short version from the PI side, not from being in it. Um, so, uh, before my recent role as professor, uh, we had a lot of um, different collaborations that we're trying to coordinate all over the place. Actually, with um, Cyan and Aaron at High Seas in January of 2020, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, and communication is the big barrier. So, we we did everything we could to try to have everything you know written, but concisely written uh, in protocols so that the research would be understandable and that we would minimize questions knowing that they might not have any bandwidth to actually email. They might not be like, they're not gonna be able to send just say a instructional or we can't send an instructional video to them. So trying to front load everything so that they have it available um, to you know run their different uh, experiments. And I think that kind of goes for um, a lot of the different things that we actually, that was communication on experiments was one of the big issues that we had uh, even in the Arctic. There were, there was one uh, experiment. I hope I'm, not, I'm doing my best. I will not offend anyone, but the experiment was called weeping cliffs. It's a phenomenon where the water comes out of the side of the slope as uh, the permafrost is melting. And the, we didn't have a lot of instructions going into it. It was kind of open-ended. It was kind of um, not an add-on, but it was kind of like, this is something we want to look into. And so our first EVA for that was to like go to a specific site, um, look, for, like, look for evidence of the kind of water flow, if you will. And uh, it was extremely frustrating for the lead geologist because there were like very little instructions. Um, so we joked that the, that the uh, geologists were weeping and the cliffs were not. Um, but that's that's the hard part. It's like communication, f training. Of course, training has always been the big part here. Um, how do you? But how do you train a crew that's maybe never met each other before, and they're they're just getting together for two weeks? Um, all those aspects need to come into play. So, if you're con if you're leading research, conducting research, bringing research to these places, um, go through your own kind of dress rehearsal of what you think you need, and then hand over all that info to someone who's never seen it before. Um, assuming they've, you know, have zero training and there's, if you're involved with universities, there's plenty of students that you can ask to volunteer, um, and go through it with them and see, see where the questions pop up. Let them break it essentially, like let them break the protocol, break the equipment, maybe, and maybe not, depending on how sensitive it is, um, and use that as a way of preparing for, uh, sending it out to a crew. And then of course, try to make sure you 
you've slated time before this person runs away to their adventure that you've gone through it with them and they've tried using it. They've tried plugging it in. They've tried maybe data syncing. Like we had a bunch of uh, Hexoskin uh, life shirts that were taking uh, data and we're, we're kind of hoping we would get the data during the mission, but those things might not be available with um, the actual bandwidth side of communication as well. Yeah, I think um, that speaks to uh, two, three different elements. So the first is um, when you have external experiments coming in, and I think that our community really needs to welcome and embrace sponsored experiments or external experiments, uh, different kind of companies sponsoring work uh, as means of being able to test out different uh, pieces of technology. I had a, a dehumidifier at high seas that broke and you kind of have to fix it. So I was in communication and sending emails back and forth via mission control to the person who was the manufacturer to try to fix this dehumidifier. And it was it was just so, so sad, so frustrating that you bring this big piece of equipment and you're not able to use it. And I think that that kind of leads me to the second aspect of research is that you have to carry it all with you. And so compactness really, really matters. I remember talking to uh, Brandy about this, about how um, <laughs> there, there just is not enough room for all the things that you want to do if you have to bring a duffel bag. And so the kind of weight limit on experimentation is true both in a real space environment and in an analog environment. And then lastly is the time. So like what Ryan is saying, you have to be very diligent, uh, diligent about planning out the different aspects of your experiment, you really have a far less time in a two week mission than you think. Um, and so divvying up those re responsibilities and being able to lean a little bit heavier on your crew uh, is really important so that human factors comes into play. Yeah, I will take an advantage of uh, as me as, uh, as a newcomer to this analog mission field. Uh, what I see from my perspective um, is uh, maybe missing research on, on some coordination. Because you know, to, nowadays we see it. We have a lot of ongoing missions, either real or virtual. Uh, the question is uh, how how the results are basically analyzed. I mean, these, these group results uh, from all the missions, and uh, whether we are able to answer maybe some questions already or are still not. Yeah, uh, I can I can second that. Um, there, there seems to develop almost a kind of competition between different uh, missions, different uh, organizers, but um, we need hundreds, if not thousands of analog missions, and we need to, to have some common platform where we, we share the experiments that we are going to do so that we don't duplicate um, it or in some in some cases we must duplicate it because we need a larger number of participants for example in in psychological experiments but also in technical runs we need to be more coordinated also to identify the gaps in research yeah what what has been done and what still what still needs to be done um another another um difficulty that can arise is is um, comes from environmental factors. So if we have technical experiments, if we if we uh, drive rovers, if we fly drones, we are even in an analog mission. We are very much dependent on the weather, and uh, the analog side it it can prohibit running an experiment if it's too windy, if it's raining, if it's too cold, if it's too hot. So there is also a, a risk of that, uh, and we need to um, build enough flexibility into our flight plans that we have uh, we have backup slots to run an experiment. And just to kind of add on to all of that, I think that um, you know being a jigsaw puzzle master or you know being the one who can control all of these moving parts is critical because I would agree with you know elements of what every single panelist said um, and the key you know the key theme in my experiences has been you know have a plan have a backup plan to the plan have a backup plan to the backup backup plan and then also be willing to adapt and abandon all of that to what the situation demands um, you know the number one success criteria for the missions that I've been a part of have been knowing your crew ahead of time um, you know I, I I now when I hear meetings to you know strangers and living with them for two weeks right now, I stop and I give that pause and say, well, 
that's not what we would do in space flight. The team dynamics are critical. We would develop them way ahead of time. Um, you know, and for example, with the Neptune mission, the underwater mission, part of the success was, um, you know, that we had st like formed, stormed, normed, and performed way eight months in the lead up to the mission. And we knew each other and we knew each other's pain points. And so, you know, I were, um, I'm smiling behind the scenes because I can see one of my crewmates from the Neptune mission is in the audience. Um, and, you know, those are the kind of dynamics you can build um, with that kind of long-term preparation. So, you know, the bottom line is um, you have to prepare, but you also have to be prepared to deviate from the plan. You have to know the crew, you have to know yourself. Um, and, you know, you also have to be very, very humble because when you mis make mistakes, and you will make mistakes. They are on display for everyone to see. There's no room for sweeping it under the rug. There's no room for saying that didn't happen. There's only room for hum humility and learning from that mistake. Yeah, all excellent, excellent points. Um, we're coming close to the end of the hour. I, we've had such great conversations. There's so much more to discuss, but um, maybe just a, a time for a few questions. Um, that were posed from the audience. And I, I had a quick question for you guys, but um, there is a question, let's see, um, lunar base or lunar gateway, which do, would you rather for your research? I think I know what Dr. Pandy is gonna say. <laughs> lunar base, hands down. <laughs> I'm not the gateway. <laughs> No, um, you know, so we're moving into an era of surface operations. We're going back to the moon. There's so much I want to know about the medical aspects of surface EVA. You know, how does how are we interacting with the lunar regolith? There are hundreds of pages of documentation of how bothersome that dust was. You know, um, you know, we get a broken bone. We have a trauma on EVA. What does the return to base plan look like? I know we're running out of time, so I'll leave it at that. But there is so much out there that I'm fascinated about for lunar surface operations. Anyone else want to chime in? I'll say base just because of EVA. We want to walk, want to play in the dirt. Um, and I think that's the, the something that we need as our next step in space uh, research evolution is to be able to have humans interacting with these celestial bodies. And uh, I love micro G. I love, you know, space stations and working on both lander and orbital stations or currently or not anymore, I guess, for lander. But, um, you know, it's the surface that's like compelling and, and really what I want to see more work done on and prepping for. Well, hopefully we'll all be doing some amazing research on the moon within the next decade. So, um, I just had a quick question for you guys. It's kind of a fun one, a favorite non-science um, or step away from your research activity that you like to recharge your batteries, um, just to get to know you a little bit more real quickly. Sure, um, I can take that off the top of my head. Language lessons working out, playing with my pair of keys. Space uh, research is not only my profession, it's also my hobby, so it does energize me. I think a lot of people are like you too. <laughs> yeah, for me it's diving, you know, I can be on analog every day, every hour, so yeah, it's diving. I play hockey at least twice a week and I've got two little kids. So that's basically my life <laughs> besides and work exact work and play same. It's my life and my hobby. It's Saturday. Here we are, right? I'm, I'm hiding in the office again. Um, for me, it's, it's playing music. I actually was um, part of this sort of psych experiment of playing uh, audio and noise at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, sunrise and sunset. And so I think that uh, there's a whole lot of interesting things culturally um, when it comes to music and food in analog environments and outside of analog environments. Those are the things that I really enjoy doing as well. You're like me, Elliot. I, I get into the music and it just it, it infiltrates all things. Um, I'm sorry that we don't have more time for questions. Um, there was a quick question in a two-week mission. How much time do you realistically get to work on your own projects? I know we don't have time for the panel, but I'll just speak to that very quickly. Um, you have time for preliminary research, and you definitely, you know, it goes by fast, but you do get a lot done. Um, obviously, you're not going to be running any long-term studies, but for preliminary research and data collection, it's been great for me and um, for other people that I've worked with. And you can always go back, so... Um, 
I would encourage anyone to at least have that experience. Um, you can do, if you're not an engineer or a scientist, you can do many other types of research in analog settings. So um, with that, I wanna thank everyone on the panel. Um, you've been amazing. I'm sure people will be reaching out to you Thanks. with questions. And um, I wanna thank the organizers of the conference, um, Jess, thank you so much. Um, to my mentor and friend, Dr. Siam Proctor, thank you. Um, and to Dr. Musilova, thank you as well. So everyone have a, a great Saturday and I look forward to the rest of the conference.